Well, good morning. It is uh, great to be with you this morning. We are uh, in a, a little mini series in the equipping hour here. Omri started last week on uh, leadership leadership lessons. Uh, he uh, he is going to come back next week and, and finish that series. So I just had an opportunity this morning to, to jump in and just just work through something that that I've been been studying, that I've been uh, convicted by and encouraged by, just thinking about uh, stewardship, uh, stewardship in light of eternity. When you hear the word uh, stewardship, I think most of us think about finances, probably, thinking about, okay, how do I steward money? Uh, maybe you, I, I remember in, probably in middle school or in grade school, here in, uh, you know, some kind of pitch that if you save $100 a, a month for the next 30 years, you know, with 5% interest, you're going to be a millionaire by the time you're 35 or something like that. Well, that, uh, that is not, not what we're going to talk about today. We're not talking about uh, financial stewardship in that sense, but really looking at stewardship of, of what the Lord has entrusted to us, all the things that he has given to us, uh, the things that, that we have from him, which, which includes money, but our time, our energy, our resources, our gifts, our abilities, uh, how to use all those things uh, in light of eternity. Uh, last week, Omri, in his uh, lesson on leadership, his fifth point, he said, uh, godly leaders, this was his, I think it was his fifth point, godly leaders embrace the leadership which has been entrusted to them by God. That there is a, an entrustment by God to lead. And we're going to broaden that a little bit, not just talk about, about leaders. He was really emphasizing for, for men to be leaders. We're just going to talk about just the entrustment that God has given to each of us. Uh, whatever, whatever sphere of influence you have, whatever responsibilities you have, uh, that you are a, a steward. Whether you're in school, whether you're a parent, whether you have a job or not, you are a, a steward of what God has given you. So just think about all of the, the areas of responsibility that you have, all of these areas to, to steward. You think about your time, you can think about money, obviously, resources, uh, talents and abilities, the, the things the Lord has given you, the gifts that he's given you, uh, your unique resources uh, that you have. Uh, in the Bible, we talk about spiritual gifts in the New Testament. You have spiritual gifts the Lord has given for the edification of others. There's a stewardship for those things. You obviously have specific areas of stewardship. If you have a job, there's uh, being a good steward at work with your job. You, you, if you're a parent... Uh, just a huge stewardship, a huge responsibility to care for the souls of your children, uh, for husbands to, to be a steward, to, to be responsible for the care of their wife. So just think about all of these responsibilities that we have. In all of these, we want to, to make it our ambition, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 9, make it our ambition to please the Lord in whatever responsibility, whatever, whatever things the Lord has in front of us. Uh, think about Romans 12, 1. Paul says to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. Offer your bodies as living sacrifices. And we can think about that verse and it, it'd be kind of vague. Okay, what does that look like? Well, I just want to put some specific categories in front of us. So we think about uh, our whole bodies, all of us, all of our time, all of our gifts, all of our resources, all of our energy, everything going after being pleasing to Christ. So we're just going to look at two passages this morning, really two parables from Jesus, just to help set our minds right in terms of thinking about, about using our, our responsibilities, what the Lord has entrusted to us uh, with a, an eternal mindset. You think about stewardship, uh, the word steward, this is the, the idea that you are a caretaker of something that is not yours. You're a caretaker of something that is not yours. You are watching it. You are taking care of it. There's an idea there that you're going to give an account for it. It's going to be demanded back of you. You have to give it back to the owner. And so there's a, a weight in that. Uh, this last week, we were at a conference in Florida, a bunch of men from the church here. And uh, someone at the, at the conference, we actually stayed at someone's house. They opened up their home and they let, they let us borrow a truck. So I'm driving someone, else, someone else's truck. And there was a, you know, a greater responsibility that I felt. If I had rented a car... Well, I'm not super worried if you, if you scratch a rental car, but this is somebody else's. I have to give it back to them at the end of the week. And the, uh, the very first night, I'm backing up out of the driveway, and I, and I feel something like under the car, and they just kind of drive off, and then someone in the car says, hey, did, did you just hit that mailbox uh, back there? And uh, the mailbox is kind of bent a little bit. And uh, 
I think, I think we got it, got it sorted out, but you just see that, you know, that for me, this burden of, oh, this is not my truck. This is someone else's truck. I want to give it back to them better than I found it. So that's when we talk about stewardship. That, that's the idea that, that what we have, the things that we have, even the time that we have, the energy that we have, the, the responsibilities that we have, these things are not ours. They have been entrusted to us. They've been entrusted to us by the king, and he's going to come back. And we're going to have to tell him, this is what I've done with all of these things that you have given me, all the things that you have entrusted to me. This is what I've done with them. So we are just stewards. Think about someone who, who owns a business versus someone who's a manager of a business. Right? The manager of the business, it's not theirs. They're just managing the assets of the owner. They're trying to, to provide a, a better, better resources. They're trying to grow a business for the sake of the owner. So we're going to see that in, uh, in Matthew 25. If you turn to Matthew 25, we're just going to look at, again, two parables this morning. One is uh, the parable of the talents, a familiar parable to you, Matthew 25. And then also in, in Luke 12, a uh, parable of the, the rich fool. So turn to Matthew 25 and verses 14 through 30. And here, uh, Jesus, this is actually in the context of, of Jesus giving a future prophecy in the, what's called the Olivet Discourse in Matthew here. He's actually talking about his second coming when the king returns. And you get to this parable in Matthew 25, and Jesus is going to tell us, here's what kingdom citizens live like in light of the king coming back. All right, we live between Jesus' two comings. This is what, what Smed preached about last week, that Jesus is coming back to be king. So how should we live today uh, with a, a focus on the, the coming of, of the king? And you have in this parable, the parable of the talents here, you have the, a master who is leaving on a journey, and he's going to come back, and he's going to demand an accounting. What have you done with all the things that I've given you? So let's read together. I'm just going to read a couple verses at a time and make some comments uh, as we go. So Matthew 25, verses, uh, starting in verse 14, Jesus says, For it is just like a man about to go on a journey, who called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, each according to his own ability, and he went on his journey. See, this word talents, if you look in your margin, it, it might say that it's uh, 15 years wages. So the master is entrusting 15 years wages to his servants, and then he's going on a journey. So the idea here is, here's this, this large amount of money, grow this on my behalf until I return. Think about here in America, a year's wage, somewhere between maybe fifty and $65,000 would be average American income. Uh, 15 years of that would be about a million dollars. I think it's helpful for us just in context to say, here's a million dollars, I'm leaving on a trip, grow this, grow these assets until I come back. And, and you know, parables are, are earthly realities that, that give us spiritual truth. So Jesus here is giving us a, a picture here to, to emphasize a, a spiritual reality. So you think about these talents, this money that's on display. You can think about it in terms of all, all of the things we've been talking about, your time, energy, your resources, your gifts and abilities, uh, opportunities and skills, all the things that the Lord is, has entrusted to you. How are you going to use these things until he comes back? And notice here that it, it says in verse 14 that, that the master entrusted his possessions to them. These are the masters. These are not the slaves' possessions. They belong to the master. Just to, to remind us that, that one, the Lord doesn't need us. He graciously gives to us. He graciously gives abilities and gifts to us. He gives resources to us that, that now we are responsible. We, ha we have been entrusted with to, to serve him with those things. And this is a, a privilege. It is a privilege to us that, that God would give us things to, to be able to serve him. And, I, and as I read this parable, I think about it. I used to be uh, kind of in the, worked for a, a small investment group. And, uh, and we would actually invest in small businesses, the guys that I worked for. And they would always be looking for the, the right kind of, of leader to invest with. Because everyone can come up with a business idea. Everyone has you know, the next, this next you know, million dollar idea. Well, ideas aren't really worth that much if you don't have the, the right leader, the right operator, the person that actually is going to see it through. So you try to find the right person that has enough experience 
to actually follow through on this idea, and also enough drive to, to get it done. And it's just interesting, because someone that's, that's too young, they don't actually appreciate the, the amount of money that's being entrusted. They just, they're, they're headstrong. They, they might be uh, too aggressive, make too many mistakes. But if you find someone that's, that's maybe too established, uh, at least in the investment world, then they, they have too much to lose. They're not willing to make any mistakes. You know, I have to pay for my kid's college. I'm not going to bet, bet all this money on this idea. So you're trying to find this person that's, that's experienced, that's hungry, that sees the, the responsibility and the stewardship, that wants to get after it. So that's what I think of when I read this parable, is, is the, just the entrustment of, a, of an investment to someone, to grow this. You're investing in someone. There's, a, there's an idea here that, okay, I have to work hard. I have to see this as a privilege. I need to return this money back. So there's a, a weight here. There's a weight of stewardship. And also notice what he says uh, in verse 15, that he gave five, two, and one, each according to his own ability. Each according to his own ability. Not, everyone is not given the same amount. We're all not given the same gifts. We're all not given the same abilities. We're all not given the same opportunities. I've heard uh, one pastor talk about even just spiritual gifts uh, with an idea of uh, the wattage of a light bulb. I, th- I thought it was really helpful just thinking about different wattages of, of light bulb, maybe 100 watt, 200 watt. The, the goal isn't how do I look like this person, but how do I maximize my own wattage in that sense? How do I live up to my full potential? How do I use all of my, my abilities to the maximum potential with the, what the Lord has given me? So this, when he says each to his own ability, it takes away any comparison, any looking at others. To say, okay, I, just, I need to be faithful with what the Lord has entrusted me. If I'm a student, if I'm a mom, I'm going to be the best student, the best mom, the best worker. I want to be the best wife, the best husband, because the risen Christ has given me this responsibility, this stewardship. You think about, I was just thinking about kids in school. We have different kids that can, can read at different abilities. So you could look at someone and say, man, that kid reads so fast. He must be a really hard worker. He's really being faithful. Well, the reality is the, the one that could read, the, the one that reads slower might be working a lot harder. They might be a lot more faithful because they're, they're struggling and they're being diligent. So it's not, it's not a matter of, of uh, externals, who is getting the most done, but, but internals. Who is the, the faithful one here? And that's what we're going to see. That's, that's what the master is about, is, is faithfulness. So look at verses 16 through 19. Immediately, the one who had received the five talents went and traded with them and gained five more talents. In the same manner, the one who had received the two talents gained two more. But he who received the one talent went away and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. So you see the master has left and two of them have, have gotten busy with the work. They have gone after it. They have been industrious. They have tried to, to build the master's fortune. And the one just buried what was entrusted to him. And look at the, the commendation here to the, the faithful servants. Verse 21. His master said to him, sorry, verse 20. The one who had received the five talents came up and brought five talents more, saying, Master, you entrusted five talents to me. See, I have gained five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Also, the one who had received the two talents came up and said, Master, you entrusted two talents to me. See, I have gained two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And notice the, what the, the servants here are commended for. They're not commended for the, the amount of return. It's not to say, you, you had five and you had two. What are they commended for? They're commended for their faithfulness. You were faithful with a few things. Notice verse 21 and 23. He says the exact same thing to both of them. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Verse 23, same exact thing. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. This is what the Lord is after, is faithfulness. 
He's not looking at some external result. They were both faithful in the same ways with whatever gifts, abilities, talents they had. They were faithful. That's, that's the measure of success here is faithfulness. And then look at the, the wicked slave. Verse 24 and 25. The one also who had received the one talent came up and said, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. And I was afraid and went away and hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. And just to, to make a few comments on the, the wicked slave, you can see his character come out. You can see both his character and, and how he views the master. He, he fears the master in a sense, but, but not respect, no appreciation, no love for the master. He's scared of the master. I, I knew you were a, a judge. I knew you would reap. I knew you, I knew you actually would demand from me. But this isn't, uh, you think about fear of the Lord, a reverence for God. This isn't a fear of the Lord. This is fear of punishment. To be, to be scared of, of what God might do to you, but not a, a love for God, not devotion to God. So he has a, a wrong view of the Lord here. This is the problem. A wrong view of God. He's saying, what you were asking is too hard for me. This was too hard. You were too demanding. You hear the self-pity, woe is me. I couldn't have done anything about this. You set me up to fail. Do you see how he he views the master? He's making an accusation against the master. This is your fault, master. You did this to me. Do you see here there's issues in the way that he views the the master? This is a theology proper issue, a view of God that's distorted. And you see a, a lack of faith. He is not trusting the goodness of the master. You have given me this and I have no ability to carry it out. I do not have the ability. I couldn't have done it. I'm stranded here. So no faith in the master, low view of the master, uh, no love for the master. Just think about all the self-protection. I took the money and I looked after myself. I wanted to protect myself. So I buried it. I didn't do anything. And at the end of, of his life here, he has nothing to show for it. This is a tragedy, wasted life here. Uh, self-protection, self-love, scared of judgment, but, but no fear of the Lord. I was thinking recently about this quote. I just love this quote from Nate Saint. Nate Saint was the, the pilot with Jim Elliott to the, the Aka Indians, who were the, the, the pilot, Nate, Jim Elliott, two other men were speared to death as they tried to bring the gospel. But this is what he says. Nate Saint says, and people who do not know the Lord, ask why in the world we waste our lives as missionaries. They forget that they too are expending their lives. And when the bubble has burst, they will have nothing of eternal significance to show for the years that they have wasted. And that's the the tragedy here for this this wicked slave. Look at what the, the master says to him. Verse 26. But his master answered and said to him, You wicked, lazy slave. You knew that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I scattered no seed. You ought to have put my money in the bank. On my arrival, I would have received my money back with interest. He, he is saying, if you really understood that I was the judge, if you actually, actually believed, as you say, that I'm, that I'm a judge, that I'm going to give an accounting, then you would have lived differently. You did not live as if I was judge. He's using God's character as a defense. Because you're hard, because you're a judge. But he's saying, you did not live as if I was judge. It did not change how you acted. If you knew in your soul that there would be a reckoning and you still buried it, you still live for yourself. You ignored eternal realities. And this is the one who, who sees the sunrise every day who sees the, the power of the Lord, the, the heavens that declare the glory of God day after day, and yet suppresses the truth in unrighteousness. It does nothing with what God has entrusted to him. So this rebuke here, you wicked, lazy slave. And that word lazy is just so cutting as I read it. The issue here was laziness. He didn't want to work hard. He had a, he had a wicked heart. And how did that manifest? In laziness. He just loved comfort. He loved ease. He had his own little kingdom that he was trying to build. He didn't want to upend all the the good things that he had in life. 
I used to, in my last uh, job, used to lease uh, office space, and we'd have people come in to, to tour, a lot of times from the East Coast, looking to reloc relocate companies uh, to Phoenix from maybe Boston, New York, cheaper office space here, more, more workforce. But they would, I, I heard this, them say this several times, different people, they would just say, man, the, the Phoenix culture is just so different. It's just, there's just so much more, more laziness, more ease. People just want to chill. Like The reason they moved to Phoenix is so they can, they can hike, they can go outdoors, they can play golf. And just People just don't work hard here. That was a, often what people would say coming from the East Coast. I was just thinking about that, just a, a culture of ease, uh, of comfort, of outdoor activities, recreation, all these good things that God has given, that those things can, can suck us in, can draw us. Right? Our hearts want to be lazy. We love, we love to just to sit and chill. Our flesh loves that. But, but consider all of the, the gifts, the resources, the time that the Lord has given for this man to stand before the Lord and say, you were lazy with the things that I gave you. You just wanted to, to hang out, enjoy the sun, hike, and do nothing of, of eternal significance. I was just thinking about the, the tragedy. You think about, I mean, we all have different gifts, different abilities. Not, not everyone is to, to be a missionary. Not everyone is to, to go to unreached people groups. But, but just thinking about the, the tragedy it would be if someone had the, the gifts the abilities, they were a gifted evangelist, had the mental capacity to learn, desires to go into the mission field, opportunities even, and they, and they don't do it. They squander it just because they were lazy, because they love comfort, because they didn't want to do hard things. Or maybe just a, a, little, a little closer to home, maybe just the, the dad who is just wants to be comfortable after a, a hard day of work, wants to sit on the couch a little longer when the kids are over here needing, needing discipline, needing correction, and saying, no, right now in this moment, I don't want to be faithful to this responsibility because I just I want to sit on the couch a little longer. And I've, I've heard people do that. I don't know that I have experience in that, but so I've heard. But that, but that is the issue, to say God, God has given these responsibilities and to, to neglect them for, for a love of comfort, for a love of self. This is uh, self-love. Right, ignoring the, the stewardship, back to this idea of stewardship, that God has entrusted you all these things to be a steward of those. There's a responsibility. This is a privilege. Verse 27, the master says, you could have at least put it in the bank. You could have got the, the bare minimum investment. Just think about just the, the investment world, like risk and return go hand in hand. You, you take bigger risk to try to get a bigger return. You take a, a low risk and you get a little return. Right? He's, he's saying here, you could have at least taken the lowest risk. You could have gotten the, the bare minimum return by taking a little risk, but you didn't do anything. The, the implied question here in verse 27 that the master is asking is, why, why would I have given you the talent to bury it? I could have buried the talent myself. I could have dug a hole and left it and come back and got it. I, I gave it to you so that you would steward it, so that you would work it, so that you'd use those things to, to build my, my empire, to build my resources. So you see the, the wicked slave here is, is self-absorbed, didn't care for the master, didn't want to please the master. He didn't care about hearing the master say, well done, good and faithful servant. He didn't care about the master's business because he was all, all, only concerned about his own business. So all of these gifts, these abilities, these resources, all of his time for himself, all of his resources, this wicked slave used for his own enjoyment, all of his gifts to promote himself, all of, all of his relationships to promote love of self. And just consider, uh, as believers, that we have also been entrusted with a, a message, the only message that could save sinners, the only message for those who are perishing in a lost and dying world. And we could, with that message, just hold it to ourselves, be, be lazy like this slave, be focused on self, and, and just squander opportunities, squander this immense, immense privilege to be ambassadors for the king. And look at the, the result here for this slave. Verse 28. Therefore, take away the talent from him. Give it to the one who has ten, ten talents. 
For everyone who has, more shall be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. Now throw out this worthless slave into outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And as you, as you just, just remind you about parables, this is not a parable about, about justification, about how does someone get into heaven. There is only one way to heaven through the, for a sinner to get into the presence of God through the blood of Christ. This is not a parable about how you get to heaven. This is a, a parable about how to live in light of eternity. Those who have been saved by the grace of the gospel, they would prove themselves to indeed be, be Jesus' kingdom citizens by the way they live. So you prove yourselves to be sons of the kingdom by what you do with what the Lord has entrusted you. Those who are saved by the gospel, they live this way. They live for the, the pleasure of the master. And the wicked, the lazy slave, proved himself to be an imposter. So just consider the, whatever responsibilities that you have this week, in this season of life, to, to go after being the, the best employee, the best mom, the best wife, the best student, best father, whatever responsibilities. For, for a young man that's, that's trying to prepare for marriage, what do I do to prepare for marriage? Be faithful where you're at today. You have been entrusted with all these things. Use them for the sake of the king. That is the, the principle here. Will you be faithful when the master returns? And this parable is, is haunting, it's compelling, it, it helps give us motivation, again, in this realm of stewardship, how to, to use the things that the Lord has given for the sake of, of his glory, for the sake of his kingdom. And I just want to look at one more passage this morning, just, a, just really a parallel theme, but a different angle and the same idea. If you would turn to Luke 12, Luke 12, Luke 12, verses 13 through 21. And Jesus, again here in Luke 12, is going after uh, motivations, to have an eternal motivation. Why why you do what you do. To have a a motivation to embrace uh, the stewardship that God has given. So in this, you have the setup. I'm sure you're familiar familiar with the parable. You have a setup to the parable, verses 13 through 15, and then the, the parable itself, starting in verse 16. So look at the setup here, verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to him, that is Jesus, he said, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. So you have Jesus teaching, and then someone from the, cr- the crowd is looking to Jesus as a, an arbiter, a civil, the one who could settle civil disputes. This wouldn't be uh, uncommon for the rabbis to be arbiters, to, to settle mat- matters of civil dispute. But Jesus here is talking about eternal realities. You have the the king on the scene. And this man is worried about about his inheritance, about his his financial resources. It's like that that question that sometimes gets asked. If you could spend an hour with anyone from history, who would you choose? And for this man, he's saying, I I would choose the creator so that he could could actually settle this this family dispute. Just, Just such a low view of Christ. Such a low view of what's going on here as Jesus is preaching about the kingdom. Oh, hey, can you actually help me? I have a a civil matter. I have some money that I need attended to. So he comes to Jesus looking for material help. And Jesus is actually going to point him in the right direction. Here's what you need to focus most on. is not not material resources, but on your soul. On eternal realities, on your heart. And Jesus uh, answered in verse 14. It's so interesting because he said, man, who appointed me a judge or arbiter over you? I mean, Jesus is the judge and the arbiter, appointed by God to, to stand as, as judge of this earth. But rhetorically here, Jesus is saying, well, why am I the, the judge of this, of this issue? If you want me to judge, I will tell you what you must be concerned about. And this is where Jesus goes. I'm not going to judge civil matters. I'm going to judge the, the motives of the heart that's what you need to be concerned about. And look, that's what Jesus says in verse 15. He goes after the heart issue. Jesus said to them, Beware and be on guard against every form of greed. For not even when one has an abundance does his life consist in his possessions. 
So this is what you must be focused on. Not possessions, not, not material things, but on your heart. How does your heart use those things? How does your heart view those things? Do you love those things? What does your heart do with the stuff that you have? He says, life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. That, that is to say, there is, there is no life there. Those things cannot give life. Jesus tells us where life is found. John 17, 3, where is eternal life found? Jesus says, eternal life is found in knowing you, he says to his Father, knowing you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. That is where life is found, not in, in possessions, not in circumstances, not in material things but in, in communion with the living God. And we have to tell our hearts this, that stuff is not going to make our hearts more happy. I had to have this conversation recently with, with one of my kids who, who got to ride in a, a friend's Tesla. We rode in a Tesla, and, it, and it's like, man, it was so fast. And, and you know what? They actually have video games in the car. You can't play them when you're driving. You have to be stopped. But they have, you can play Xbox in the car. It's like, we need to get a Tesla. And, uh, and just got to have this conversation that, man, as cool as that is, there's nothing about that that's going to make our hearts more happy. We don't, we don't need it. It's not, the, it's not the path to joy and hope. I mean, it's the same conversation in the grocery aisle with a four-year-old. You know, I need that piece of candy. Like, that candy is wonderful, but it's actually not going to do anything for your soul. You, you don't need that candy. True life, eternal life is found in Jesus Christ. That's where hope is found. These things that we have, these are tools. These are gifts that God has given to us to, to serve him. So this man comes to Jesus with a, you could say, a, a me-centered Christianity. How do I find purpose in my life? Maybe Jesus can fix my, my problems. Maybe he can help me have a better life. And this man clearly views himself wrong. He views Jesus wrong. He views his possessions wrong. So back to the idea of stewardship. This is, again, man-centered. This man's view is man-centered. What's in it for me? And now Jesus is going to get into the, the parable here to, to drive this point, this point home. How to view your, again, your resources, your responsibilities, your time, your energy. How do you view these in light of eternity? Well, let's look at, look at the parable here. Verse 16. He told them this parable, saying, The land of a rich man was very productive, and he began reasoning to himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, This is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grains and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your soul is required of you. And now who will own what you have prepared? So is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Jesus goes on to say at the end of this section, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So this is the issue, to, to look at all of these, these gifts that we've been given with an eternal perspective. To ask the question, what, what do I value? Do I value hearing the master say, well done, good and faithful servant? Or is my treasure in earthly things, in indulgence, in, in pleasure, in comfort, in fun, relationships, entertainment? Whatever things would take my focus away from the Lord. And here in, in the parable, this, this rich man, it's so helpful for us to see his, his disposition, the, the heart issue going on how he views his possessions. So in verse 16, it says the land of a rich man was very productive. So we, we see that this man is a, is a farmer, an agrarian society here in Israel. He has a lot of land. He has a productive harvest. This is where the starting point. And what's so, what's so interesting to think about, just, just the, the business of farming, what is all of that business dependent on? All of it's dependent on the rain, on what God provides. You could work hard, you could labor, you could make all the right choices. And if God doesn't provide rain, if there's a drought, you're not going to make any money. You would have a devastating harvest without rain. So he has a productive season. And who does he credit for his success? 
Look who he credits. He doesn't say, man, the Lord gave all of this to me. The Lord was so kind to provide rain this season. I worked hard, I labored, and God provided. But what does he do in verse 17? He reasons to himself, what shall I do? Since I have no place to store my crops. You hear the the self-sufficiency. These are mine. I did all of this. Look at what my hands have made. You think about Nebuchadnezzar standing over Babylon. You look at this great Babylon that my hands have made with my own power and my strength. That's what's going on here. Look at what I have done. No acknowledgement for the the Lord here, the one who provided the rain, the one who grew the crops. I mean, a farmer just plants the seed. They can't do anything after that. I mean, they 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 can spray it. They can, you know, shoo pests away. They can't actually make plants grow. The Lord does that. And he takes the credit. And look at what he says over and over again. Verse 17 and 18, uh, 19. Look at what I will do with my crops. Here's what I will do. I will tear down. I will build up. I will store. And I will say to my soul. I mean, at least seven times here, the word I is used. I, me, mine. This is the, uh, the Gollum syndrome. Right, Gollum, my, my precious. He's thinking only about himself. All of this stuff is mine. And I think when I used to read this, and I read about, you know, this man builds bigger barns, as if the issue was he was just amassing a, a big empire. Well, I don't think the, the issue is that he is that he is planning for the future. I don't think the problem is that this man is being industrious. The problem isn't that he has a large savings account, that he's saving, that he's working hard. I mean, that's, those are commendable things. It is good to save. It is good to, what, what would be the option for him to waste the crops? No, it's good that he's building barns to, to store this in. The, the issue isn't his industriousness. The issue isn't the, the size of his estate. The issue is who is he serving? That's the issue. What does he love? Who is he working for? I mean, you see it here. My, me, mine, my soul. Now I get to enjoy. I get to have an easy life after this. I've worked hard. And now I can enjoy it. And that's that's not stewardship. That's not pursuing faithfulness. That's not living in light of eternity. The issue here isn't that he has money. The issue is that he loves money. That he loves these things. Uh, 1 Timothy 6 says, All who desire to be rich fall into a trap. That the love of money is the root of all evil. This inordinate desire to to see the the things that you have, not just possessions, but the the gifts, the resources, the the time that you have, and to, to view all of those for selfish ends. How can these benefit me? This man looks at all that he owns as if it's his. He forgets about eternity, he forgets that life is short. He forgets that there is a a reckoning coming. And you hear an entitlement here. I get to enjoy all these things. I did this work and now I get to enjoy it. And this man, unlike the other man, isn't rebuked for laziness. He is industrious. He is working hard. But he's working hard for himself. In the Lord, in verse 20, God comes to him. And God gives his assessment. He says, you fool. You fool. You have to give an account. This was all on loan to you. All of this stuff, all of the rain that I gave in its season, all of these were were from my hand, and you must answer for all of them. Stewardship in view here, that you are a steward of these things. Now they're demanded back of you. You have to answer for them. He says, your soul is required of you. Your very soul was on loan from God. You must answer for your soul. You are required to to steward this significant investment from the Lord, your own soul. Did you give attention to it? The way you gave attention to all your assets. So God is saying, what did you do with the, the time, the resources, the abilities that I gave you? This man had an immense responsibility, immense gifts, immense privileges, immense opportunities. And he is a, a fool. In Proverbs, the, the fool is the one who does not fear God, the one who does not live in light of eternity, the one who does not have a Godward focus in life. That is a fool. And then God goes on to say, now all this stuff that you have, whose will it be? All this work, you weren't working for me. You weren't working for eternal things. 
You aren't working for a treasure that wouldn't fade. You are working for these temporal things that are going to burn up. You can't take them to the grave with you. They're not going to give you any, any comfort in the grave. So this is the issue. This man was focused on himself. My, my, my. God was not on his mind. His ambition was not, how do I please the Lord today? His ambition was, how do I please myself? How do I go after making the most for me? So this, this requires a, a fundamental flip in priorities, an eternal mindset. That's the idea this morning, is to, to think about stewardship, to think about resources, to think about opportunities that you have in light of eternity, to, to own the stewardship of those things, that God will demand them back from you. What did you do with these things that I entrusted to you? Did you have a, a holy ambition? Did you live in light of eternity? Or did you live for, for selfish pleasure, for things of this world? I love what uh, William Carey says. William Carey, uh, in the biography, we actually have it, I think, at the book table by S. Pierce Carey, his grandson. But William Carey, uh, in that biography, is just discouraged as he's trying to convince people uh, the need for foreign missions. He's trying to convince them. There are people that have not heard the gospel. How can we not be passionate about this? And he, he just talks about the, all of these merchants. The British Empire is willing to, to travel the seas, the East India Company, to trade spices, to trade goods. Uh, slave traders go into the heart of Africa. And he says, how can Christians not take the gospel with that kind of urgency? And there's a quote, this is what he says uh, in this quote. He says, Moravians have not turned back from Abyssinia's heat, nor from Greenland's cold. They have not turned back from difficult tongues nor savage manners. British traders press into East Indies and Persia, into China and Greenland. Cursed slave raiders dare deep into Africa. Should we Christians be less resolved and adventurous than these? If we Christians loved men as merchants loved money, no fierceness of peoples would keep us from their midst. Their very barbarism would evoke our swifter help. And I just love that statement where he says, if we Christians loved men as much as merchants loved money. You can look at the world and see all these motivations to work hard, all these motivations to, to grow their own empire, their own kingdom. Don't we have a, a greater motivation, an entrustment from the king to, to serve him, to build his kingdom, to take his gospel, to use his resources for, for eternal things? So this is a, a worship issue. Romans 12:1 again, to, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, spiritual act of worship. A uh, motivation issue. So as we, uh, as we conclude here, just in the next couple minutes, I just want to take some time just to, to kind of assess, just some practical things to assess as I've been thinking through this. How, how are you doing? What are some indicators? What are some indicators maybe of, of, a, of an earthly perspective? Maybe indicators that, that you're not living in light of eternity in some areas. And I'd like to say that I, I got this these things from, from a book, but really it's just from my own heart just to say these are areas that I can see. I can see uh, wrong motivations in the way that I use resources, in the way that I use time, in the way that I think about responsibilities. So first, just to, I, I think a, a really uh, important one to consider is just being driven by, by results, uh, being driven by outcomes, be, being driven by, by earthly circumstances. And when I say results, just to think about what, what motivates your work. What does it look like to be results-driven instead of driven by faithfulness? Well, I think just some categories. Parenting, it's an easy one to see. Our parents have specific commands, entrustment from the Lord to, to discipline, to instruct their children, to raise them up in the fear of the Lord. So faithfulness would look like going after those things. And God will, will give the results that he desires. But we can be so quick to, to want results. I want my kid to behave this way in public because, because then I look like a better parent. I mean, I'm so embarrassed that they acted up. Not because, oh man, I was unfaithful. I actually need to instruct them and help them. But because, oh man, that's embarrassing. <laughs> I, I don't want people to think, uh, think poorly of my parenting. Right, that's a, a results-driven parenting. How do I help my kid so that I look better? You know, I want to go out to eat and enjoy dinner out. So I want the kids to sit still. Well, well, kids that are obedient, a home that's in order is the fruit of faithful parenting. That is the fruit, but that's not the goal. 
The goal is how do I be faithful to, to instruct and discipline for the sake of their souls so that they, they know God's truth? How do I be faithful in that? Not driven by results, not driven by what other people think, not driven by just having a compliant kid so that I have a, a better life. And we can be just like the, the rich man in our parenting. I want my children to reflect me. I want them to make me look good. I want people to see my abilities. When we think about in school, this is the same thing, being driven by results. To say, I, I want a good grade. If you're a student in here, I just want a good grade. That's my motivation. I want to get into college. I want people to think that I'm smart. I want them to notice me. And obviously, getting a good grade is going to reflect probably the amount of work you put in. But the goal isn't just grades, uh, earthly success. The goal is how do I be faithful? I have a, a time here. I've been entrusted with, uh, with this time to work hard in school, to be the best student that I can be, to learn the material. So we can see pretty quick what's our motivation. In, uh, we had a seminary professor, Matt Waymeyer, who just he talks about every time we start a seminary class, he says, I don't care about your grade. You guys care about it. I don't care about it. I want you to learn the material. But we have to do grades because that's just what we do here. But, but he's just trying to put in front of us that, that the goal here is learning this material. If you're, if you're in seminary to, to learn, to actually get these tools, to study God's word so that you can care for God's people with his word. Well, the goal isn't, oh, I'm going to make sure I get an A. The goal is, no, I want to actually learn this. I'm accountable before the Lord for this. Think about work. I mean, work, you could have the wrong kind of motivation. You, you could just say, I, I just need to get a paycheck. Or it's good to get a paycheck. We need, we need to get, get paid. But if that's your only motivation, I don't want to get fired. I don't want my boss to be displeased with me. I don't want to be embarrassed at work. I want to look good to my peers. Rather than uh, just to embrace, the Lord has called me to provide. I want to work hard and be diligent today to serve him. To, to be diligent to provide for my family. And we can even do this even in, in spiritual disciplines. You know, this can creep into to Bible reading. To say, I want to read the Bible so that other people can say, man, you're doing a good job. So that other people think that I'm more spiritual. I want to read the Bible so that I can answer a question. Rather than, I, want to, I just want to serve the Lord. I want to know him. I want to have communion with him in his word and in prayer. So that's what I mean by being results driven. To say, I want something for myself. Rather than just a heart that says, I just want to serve the Lord with what he has for me. Another area would be uh, just comparison. Uh, again, another just indicator. How are you doing in this, in this sphere uh, of stewardship, of responsibility, of owning what God has given you? Do you compare yourself to others? Are you, are you constantly looking at other people and sizing yourself up? And this could happen two ways. I mean, you could do this. You could look at others and say, man, I'm, I'm doing a lot better than them. I'm actually doing a really good job because look at how poorly they're doing. And you start to evaluate your own spirituality your own faithfulness based on somebody else, not based on scripture. Or it could go the other way. You could look at someone else and say, well, I don't have the abilities that they have. I don't have the gifts that they have, so I can't measure up. So why would I even try? And you're just worried about how you look to others, personal significance, rather than saying, what has the Lord entrusted to me to serve in the body of Christ, to care for others? Another area just to consider is blame shifting. Do you blame shift? Do you make excuses? I mean, this is the, the man in the parable of the talents. He blame shifts. It's actually your fault, God. I didn't have the ability and the resources. I couldn't have done this. You didn't give me the, the right ability. I mean, this is what, what Adam did in the garden. I mean, in, in the fall. You know, this wife that you gave me, it's her fault. And as you read the, the account in Genesis 3, you have to wonder, where was Adam in all this? Why was he not leading? Why was he not taking responsibility? Why did he let the snake come and deceive his wife? But his response is blame shifting. He, he doesn't take responsibility, and then he's quick to, to shift blame. God, it's your fault. It's the woman you gave me. And if we're thinking faithfulness is the goal, if, if faithfulness is our goal, I just want to serve the Lord then there's, there's no room to, to shift blame. We can take responsibility. If someone sins against us, if someone makes it difficult for us, well, then how do you respond? How do I be faithful in response? How do I still take, take what happened to me and, and still serve the Lord? 
How do I take ownership of what I can control, not what I can't control? Another, another area just to consider is just your priorities. Do you have out-of-balance priorities? Again, just thinking about ways to, to diagnose. How am I doing at, at, at just being a steward of what God has entrusted? How am I doing at, at just at being responsible in whatever God has given me? The thing about out-of-balance priorities, it just, just to consider that you could be busy with a lot of things, but are they the right things? Even the, the lazy man, the wicked lazy slave, you could be busy and still be lazy, and still not work hard, not be disciplined. I mean, you could work 80 hours a week, and you're checking the box of, uh, I'm providing for my family. And at some point, you actually neglect instructing your children. So you have this weight of, yes, I'm doing this well, this responsibility, but I'm actually neglecting things over here. I'm neglecting other things that are in my care. Because we're always going gonna to gravitate to the things that we enjoy. We're going to gravitate to the things that actually feed uh, the flesh, the things that other people are going to look at and appreciate. Again, in parenting, we're going to gravitate to what gets noticed by others. So out of balance priorities would be, would be gravitating to things that get noticed, things that actually bring personal significance, rather than saying, what does the Lord require of me? What are all the responsibilities that I have? How can I do all of those well? If I'm a, a dad and a husband and an employee, a member of the body of Christ, how do I go after all those things with proper balance? Uh, just another area, as I think about, in terms of just assessing how, how this is going in, in terms of being faithful in your responsibilities, is just thinking about just, just lacking direction. Are you aimless? Do you find yourself wondering, why, why am I doing this? What should I do today? What should I go after? Maybe two days, three days in a row? I'm not really sure. I just feel kind of like, kind of just going through the motions. Omri used this word uh, vision last week to have a, he said leaders have a, a vision. And I think that that can often be kind of a, a dirty word that people use in, uh, especially in the business world where they talk about vision casting and it just becomes kind of this sleazy, you know, multi-level marketing uh, pitch. But think about vision, just, just putting a vision for yourself or for others, just to say, think of it this way, that to say, this is where I'm at, this is where I'm going, and this is how I'm going to get there. I mean, just, just boil it down to that. Do you have a, a vision, a purpose for, for areas of responsibility just to assess, here's where I'm at today, here's where I need to get to, and, and this is my plan to get there? It just takes planning. It takes direction. It takes purpose. How is my parenting going? Where are we at today? Where are we trying to get to? What are the things we need to, to implement? How am I doing at being a student this week? What are the areas I need to, to shore up? So the one who is, who is striving after faithfulness is going to have purpose in those things. Is going to work hard in those things. Is going to be diligent. They're going to have a plan. You know, it's going to look different for each person, but there's going to be planning. There's going to be assessment. There's going to be uh, even getting critical feedback, asking others, how am I doing in this? And we can be so quick just to go through the motions. I think about this in, uh, just in school of our children. Uh, we homeschool a couple of our kids, and it's so easy to, to just start to, to get in this routine of we have to get through the curriculum. Our goal is to get through this, this week, the curriculum. It's like, well, yeah, we're, we're trying to get through and teach them. But our goal isn't check curriculum off the box. Our goal is to instruct our kids, to teach them so they actually learn. So they grow in responsibility and wisdom and discernment. And so quick, we can just go into the motions of, okay, check this box, check this box. And actually never asking, why are we doing this again? What are we going after this week? How are we going after it? So that'd be another area just to consider. Um, a couple more. Um, entitlement. Entitlement. Do you, do you see, uh, again, the, the, the parable of the rich fool here? You saw the entitlement. I deserve something. I deserve this. I worked hard. Now I, I've earned it. I deserve this. Do you notice that in your heart? Do, do you think no one appreciates what I do? I should be given more responsibility. Why does no one notice me? Well, if you're serving the Lord, it shouldn't matter. If you're saying, I just want to be faithful to the Lord of what I have, and he'll give me influence, and he'll give me success in his time. So entitlement is just so devastating. That, that's, that would be an indication of a, of a heart that's, at least in those moments, is not going after faithfulness to the Lord. The uh, last one on my list here is just passivity. Passivity. And you could, you could say this is laziness, but just the, the one who just waits around, who only responds when, when there's a fire, 
And again, in parenting, this is so easy to, to be the one that's just waiting. Okay, now I have to deal with this because my kids are acting up. Now I have to deal with this rather than, than being proactive, rather than instructing and teaching. Do I have to be prodded over and over again to, to get after it? Or do I have an internal motivation without being asked? I just want to go after this area. I want to go after faithfulness here because the Lord has entrusted this to me, whatever it is, whatever situation you're in. And all these are just indicators of, of some motivation issues. This is where Jesus goes in these parables is to, to motivate us in light of eternity. To, mo- to motivate our work. To motivate uh, how we use resources. To motivate how we use our time with an eternal focus. And just to consider again that the, the king, the, the risen king, it says in, in Ephesians 4, Jesus is the exalted king in heaven and he has given gifts to his children. And in that passage, he's talking about spiritual gifts, spiritual gifts to, to serve in the body. But to think of it that way, that, that Jesus, the king in heaven, is giving us a, a stewardship, has entrusted us until he returns. So what will you do with, with the time, the resources, the opportunities, the responsibilities you have until the king returns. And we have a, an opportunity to use those things to, to exalt the risen Christ until he returns, to work hard so that we could hear with these servants, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. Let's pray together as we close and just pray that the Lord would give us uh, this kind of uh, a passion. God, Thank you for your word. Thank you for conviction that it brings. Thank you for the purpose that we get in your word. Just thank you for the clarity of of direction that we have for for our lives, Lord, that we make it our ambition to please you. So I pray that uh, just the the men and women, the young men and women in this church would, would make that their ambition through all of their responsibilities, through all of their gifts and their resources and their abilities and their time and their finances, Lord that all of those things would be directed at this singular aim of pleasing the risen Christ. Jesus, you who died for us, you who are a king, you who purchased us by your own blood, I pray that we would live as, as your ambassadors, as your stewards on this earth until you return. So we pray all these things for your name and for your glory. Amen.